Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to today's Bible study from Dominion Church International. I request you to get ready with your pen, Bible, paper. Invite somebody to join you. And then let's begin this session with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. We receive your word with meekness. Yes, with Lord. joy, mm. with gladness. Mm. Thank you for the blessing of your word. Yes, Lord. Reveal Jesus to us. Mm. Let the life in the word come alive in us. Yes, Lord. And cause the hearers mm. to act upon it. Yes, Lord. That they might live the life of God in them. Yes, Lord. To the praise and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So our dear viewers and listeners, today's text will be from the book of Romans, chapter 3, from verse 21 to verse 26. However, we shall break it up so that we are able to digest this piece by piece and be able to understand this message in its entirety. We are approaching the second phase because from Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 we saw the doctrine of condemnation. We saw what it meant when sin came to mankind. We saw that the wrath of God is upon all sin and unrighteousness of men. And this embraces everyone, the Jew and the Gentile, every man and every woman outside of Jesus Christ stands condemned, stands damned. And it is against that background that we now turn the corner. And the Bible says, but now. So he has now reached the lowest aim. All humanity is condemned. There is none righteous. None meets the standard God has set for mankind. None meets the righteous requirements of the law. Every one of us is condemned. And he now turns this corner and moves from one end of condemnation and moves to the other extreme which is the extreme of justification. And this justification is for those who believe in Christ Jesus by the grace that God has given. So here Paul opens the subject and says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. This points to a righteousness that we desperately need but cannot get hold of in our attempt to keep the law. When we refer to the righteousness of God, 
we are referring to the righteousness that God requires. And this, the Bible says, is apart from the law. So the works of the law cannot achieve it. So we cannot achieve it by keeping the Ten Commandments. So we cannot attain it by meeting the requirements of the law. Or what is revealed in God's word. In other words, there is no way by our own efforts that we can meet this requirement. Having now looked at the doctrine of condemnation, and why we fail or come short in every way to meet God's requirements of justice. And how this involves all humanity, both the Gentiles, those who are without the law, and the Jew who received the law. Paul sums it up this way. He says, We are all guilty. We are all condemned. Now, that having happened, Paul then moves the switch and declares that now, but now, the righteousness of God is revealed. And this is very transformative because herein contains the truth concerning our salvation. If you don't understand the bad news like I said before, you cannot appreciate the good news. So when we stood condemned, God then reveals how we can be justified. And this is what is painted in the text that we read. The Bible says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. This announces the righteousness that every individual craves. It unveils the righteousness which we cannot attain of ourselves, which we cannot attain by keeping the law. And why does it say the righteousness of God? What he wants us to understand is that this is the righteousness that God requires. God has set the bar. He has set the standard which everyone needs to meet if they are to be acceptable by him. So here what we have is the picture that apart from the works of the law, which we could never hope to achieve the righteousness of God, God has unveiled a solution for us. The righteousness which we cannot achieve by trying to keep the Ten Commandments or the, what is written down in the law of God. God has not brought the standard down to where we are. He has maintained his standard of his perfect holiness. And 
it remains at that. And apart from the law, now he reveals his standard. Later we will see that all of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned and we come short of the glory of God. So when we talk about God's standard, His standard reveals His glory. And when we come short of that standard which reveals His glory, then we are all guilty. So God is not going to measure us against our expectations or our own imagination or saying, okay, since you come short, then I will bring down a little so that at least the most righteous of you meets the standard. As far as God's standard is concerned, we have all been weighed. And we have all come short. So now justification comes to us apart from the law. So that is why the book of Ephesians Paul writes and says, for by grace you have been saved through faith not of yourselves. So in our own effort, we cannot attain this. Justification before God happens apart from the law. I love that old hymn, the old rugged cross. Right in there he says, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. So, so there is nothing we can bring. There is no price we can pay. It is only to the cross where we will find justification. Then Paul goes on to add and says being witnesses by the law and the prophets. What is he trying to to say because it you think okay how does the law come in here in terms of justification he's trying to paint the picture to us that the justification by faith is not something new it goes all the way from the beginning there are witnesses that we can be justified by faith witnesses to this is the law and the prophets. In other words, God's standard has not changed. From the very beginning, justification can only be achieved through faith. So what's Paul is trying to say here Paul, is that, that, that there is no new way to be saved. From the very beginning, the way to seek God's standard, the way to come into God's presence, the way to access his salvation is through faith. So whether you are in the Old Testament or the New Testament, it is through faith that we are saved. And no wonder he is actually trying to emphasize what he said in chapter 1 and verse 2. Concerning the gospel of Christ. And he says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So from the 
beginning. God has declared his righteousness. And this righteousness is achieved through faith. Let's take a step back and look at what is being said in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 15, we see Abraham having started this journey of faith with God. And it is recorded in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. And the Bible says, and he believed in the Lord. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. So what is this? The doctrine of justification by faith. Here comes out very clearly. Abraham is declared righteous through faith. The righteousness, the standard he longed to achieve was provided to him by God himself. When did that happen? When he believed in the Lord. When he placed his faith in the Lord. Then God credited him. God imputed him with righteousness. So what was the basis? It was faith and faith alone. And through that faith, Abraham received God's righteousness. Many years later, when Jesus meets the Jews, and they are talking about the faith of Abraham. He points out in John chapter 8 and he says, Abraham longed to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. And the Jews were furious. And they said, you're not even yet 50 years. Yet you say you saw Abraham. And in verse 58, the Bible tells us, he responded to them and said, before Abraham was, I am. And that's amazing because Abraham's faith from then we understand what made him glad. It is that news of the salvation, the revelation of the salvation through faith that he could be justified not based on what he had done but based on his faith in the Lord. The psalmist David writes this way Psalm 32 verse 1 and 2 the Bible says it says blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered and in verse 2 it says blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. How is sin forgiven? How is sin covered? By the blood through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, when we believe in the Lord, our sins are covered. We receive the forgiveness of sin. And instead of imputing wrath upon us, he now imputes upon us his righteousness. I understand the word impute is not a word we use commonly in our language. But the word impute simply means credited. It is like having an account and you have this account credited. Imagine your account was a 
at zero. And now somebody credits one million shillings to that account. So what has happened? You have not done anything. But your account has now been credited with a certain amount. That is exactly what he's trying to point out here. When he talks about imputed righteousness, apart from the law, he wants us to understand that now our accounts have been credited with righteousness not based on what we have done but based on what God has done and the only thing we had to do was place our faith in the Lord he goes on to say or let me put it this way when we talk about imputing righteousness, in the legal term, you would be in a dock in a court of law. And the judge pronounces you acquitted of every crime that you have committed. So now that acquittal means that what you previously had as your condemnation has now been removed away from you. And this is what he paints here. So how is that possible? Again, we go back to the Old Testament. In Isaiah 53, that wonderful text of the suffering servant of God which points to Jesus Christ. In verse 11, here we have this amazing scripture. It says, and he shall see his labor. All, and he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Talking about God. And then he says, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. The righteous servant being talked about here is Jesus Christ. And what shall he do? He shall justify many. Who are those many? Those are the ones who come to faith in him and outside the law. And what shall happen to them? The Bible says he shall remove their iniquities. And so what is it that Paul is trying to paint here? If we go back to Romans, he wants to show us that from the very beginning, God's plan of justification has been laid down. So there is nothing new that is coming up. This has been God's standard. And he goes on to say, even the righteousness of God, and what is he painting here? He wants to show something. Number one, that this righteousness belongs to God. But more than that, he wants us to understand that this dikayosuni comes from God. In other words, God is the source and the giver of his righteousness. So you cannot receive this righteousness except 
when it is God that has provided it. Putting it another way, he says that the righteousness that God requires, he himself has provided it. So he is the source of the righteousness that he demands. So, so when we talk about the imputed righteousness, it, it means that where we stand condemned, it is only God that can provide what God requires. Do you see how helpless we were? Do you see how hopeless we were? We are outside of Jesus Christ. So without God, we can't meet God's requirements. So everything concerning the righteousness of God comes outside of us. If I may take it to another degree, it even comes outside of the church. It comes outside of our world. No government can provide it. There is no mechanism that can bring it. This comes down to us from the throne of God by His grace. I like what Martin Luther called it. He called it the alien grace. It comes outside of us, outside of our world. It comes down from the throne of God. So what is the point here? When he says, even the righteousness of God, he wants us to understand that only God, and let me state it, only God, not any man, only God, not any entity, only God, not any preacher, only God, not any sacrament, only God, can provide what he requires. Because the standard that he requires is higher than what we can aspire to. It requires us meeting the law to perfection. And we cannot do that. So what is it that must happen? That means we must come to God. We must look to God. In Isaiah, he says, look unto me, all ye nations, and be saved, says the Lord. So it is to God that we look to for salvation. It is to God that we go to. We don't go to a church. We don't go to a priest. You don't go to a prophet. You don't go to anyone else. You don't go to an association. It is to God that you go. You don't go to a ministry. It is to God that you go. So the business that we have to conduct concerning salvation is con conducted with God and God alone. So the, at the heart of the gospel message, we need to be drawing people to God because that is where the righteousness comes from. And therefore, Paul goes on to say that even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus 
Christ. Yesu Christo. Here he is trying to say something. One, he rules out every other avenue. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, he makes it very particular and says this is through faith in Jesus Christ. Yesu Christo. Full stop. Now come out. So there is no way you can, you or I can receive the righteousness of God except when we exercise our faith in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work. So outside of Jesus Christ, we cannot obtain that faith. Or let me put it this way. Faith is as good as its object. So if your faith is directed to Jesus Christ as the object of your faith, that is what we call saving faith. Now, if it is faith in somebody else or something else and it is not faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that is not saving faith the faith that saves is directed at the object or the person of Jesus Christ so it is Jesus Christ who then becomes the fountain of our righteousness. It is Jesus Christ that then enables us to meet God's standard of righteousness. Why? Because he met all the requirements of the law. So it is him when we place our faith in him, then are we made righteous with God. So if we put our faith in anything else that is not Jesus Christ, then we come short of God's righteousness. Or saying it another way, concerning salvation, God will only deal with us based on our faith in his son Jesus Christ. That wonderful scripture we read about in John 3 16 then comes alive that for God so loved the world that he gave. You see what we are talking about. It is God that gives the requirement for us to meet his righteousness. And he says he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So when we talk about saving faith, we need to throw clarification to that one. Lest we get misconceived. I, I have met several people who get Jesus Christ and then add something else. When we look at this text, it says that even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ and that's enough and that's where it ends. So when we talk about 
saving faith or the faith that saves we are placing our trust in Jesus Christ and we end there we don't add anything to it. So when we are talking about saving faith, it, it goes beyond emotional feeling. It, it goes beyond head knowledge. It is coming to a point of surrender where you get everything that you are. And Lay it at the feet of Christ. And embrace everything that He is. So anything that you are is rags. When you embrace Him, then you embrace His person and what He has done for you. That is the standard that God is calling every one of us to. So you turn away from self-righteousness. You turn away from every action that you believe will make God pleased with you. The Apostle Paul puts it so well. He says, all those things that I achieved, I now consider dung. So everything is hopeless. Everything is helpless. Nothing helps. What you need is the righteousness of God. That narrows the scope. That eliminates everybody else. We don't have matters here. We don't have saints here. This is the narrow way. And this narrow way to God is Jesus Christ. No wonder he says, I am I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, except with faith through him. So any other way is the broader way. And you cannot travel on this narrow way with a heavy luggage. You cannot carry your prophets with you. You cannot carry your, your, your saints with you. you know, you cannot carry anybody else. It is you and him embracing him on this narrow way that leads to the Father. So when you come to Christ, you entrust everything to him. You embrace all that he is. Savior, Lord, Redeemer, Shepherd, Light, Salvation, everything that he is, you embrace. You cling to. You hold on. You don't add anything to it. You say, I, I see people with medals, I see people with scapulars, with all sorts of things they add to. It, it cannot happen because that is not his righteousness. His righteousness is through faith in Jesus Christ. So you don't add anything. It can't be a rosary. It can't be anything. You can't have an amulet added to it. It has just to be him and him alone. That is the saving faith. Your leg cannot be one way and your the other leg the other way. When you come to Christ and place faith in him, that faith is placed in him and in him 
alone. In other words, you burn all your bridges. And have only one and one redeemer. Only one and one helper. Only one and one savior. When you come to him that way, you experience something beyond imagination. So it can't be Christ and then a sacrament. No. It is Christ and Christ alone. And that is important for us to understand. So it is not Christ and the church membership. Going to church is good. But it is the personal relationship that saves. It is that faith in his person that saves. What is it that I mean? You can't be a member of a congregation and be away from God. It is faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. You place all your trust in him. You place all your confidence in him. When you do that, your hands are empty. Your heart is empty. And at that moment, you're ready to receive the gift of God's righteousness. Who is Jesus Christ? You receive with empty hands. You receive with an empty heart. That is burden lifting, brother. That removes every hindrance. That takes you in ways you can never achieve in your own effort. That brings you to a relationship that is fruitful to, for life. You now receive the eternal life that God gives. The religion is placed behind. All the dead works of evil are placed behind. Every sin, every burden is left behind. This is what saves. But where does it all begin? All this begins with you knowing the truth of the gospel. So, and this is important. So you get to know what Christ has done. And then you get to know also how far you have fallen. You get to know the truth about yourself. You look at yourself now as how God sees you. A sinner condemned. And then you turn to look to a savior. God's gift of righteousness which he gives free of charge. And if you are willing to let go of everything and receive this truth which is empowered by the Holy Spirit then salvation becomes a reality. Isn't it amazing today? When you ask people, what is your salvation experience? What is it you received when you gave your life to Christ? 
And not many can explain it. Why? Because they went through the motions. They, they did not understand this truth. Their hearts were not convicted. Jesus said, when the Spirit of God will come, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Let me ask you, was your heart convicted of sin? Was it convicted of the need of the righteousness of God? And of the impending judgment of God? Or on the judgment of God upon all sin and righteousness of men? Which places you in the bracket in which we all are. Did the Holy Spirit do that work? Or you were swept away by the excitement? And you are now saying, yes, I'm saved. What happened to this? And this is important. Because... And that's why you hear people saying, now I backslid. And you're like, no, you are not genuinely saved in the first place. You, you don't know how far you were. <laughs> you, you don't understand the state in which you are. When you understand the state in which you are, and where God found you and saved you, you spend the rest of your life in adoration and praise, in worship of this Redeemer who found you with nothing, who found you in a mess and made a message out of your life. The one who found you with nothing and has now given you the free gift of his righteousness. You who was condemned but now have been justified by faith. You didn't work for it. There is nothing you did on your own except placing faith in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work. So what happens it is only the act of your will when you take that step of faith and come all the way to Jesus Christ and embrace him as your Lord and your Savior. And that is important because then there is no other Lord. All other Lords have been left behind. The only Lord you have before you. The only Lord you have in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. That righteousness then becomes yours through faith. And it is received by faith alone. And the Bible goes on to say to all and upon all who believe to all and upon all who believe that means every person of every walk of life of any gender with any background of any class of any stature it doesn't matter how your background has turned out to all that believe and upon all those that believe in Christ Jesus to all 
all that believe. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter what your crime has been. It doesn't matter how many mistakes are in your past. It doesn't matter how tainted your character is. The Bible says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus is to all and upon all. To all, this would be an exclusive group of people. That is the church of Jesus Christ. That is the body of believers. Those men and women that have abandoned everything the world could give them. That have abandoned everything. Looked at their wretched cells for what they really are and embrace the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. To that group, they receive the righteousness of God. But the Bible says upon all so that means to every individual it is like to the entire group but every individual in that group receives the righteousness of God. Now they stand before God having received what God requires but that which only God can give it is then they are justified. God declares God credits to them his righteousness. So let me ask you who is there? Have you received the righteousness of God? Are you there just a member of the church? Are you there saying, yes, I know about God? Are you there saying, yes, I have a religion? Or are you there caught in the middle of nowhere? The good news is this. But now, not tomorrow, not next week, now, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is revealed to you. If you feel the spirit of the Lord convicting you of sin of righteousness and judgment, judgment because the prince of this world is already judged. So the sin and unrighteousness of men is already judged by God. You find yourself in that place. That is the right place to be. Because right now, at the cross of Christ, you can let everything go and receive the salvation that is by faith. And you will receive the righteousness of God. And then you will be able to measure up the God standard. Why don't you say this prayer with me? From the bottom of your heart. And see what God will do in your, in your life. And see what God will do in your life. Set this prayer with me. And God will do the rest. Let's pray. Say, God of heaven, creator of the universe, I stand before you condemned. I stand before you guilty. Lord, 
I believe Zikiriza. that now there is salvation. And the way out is through Jesus Christ. Your only begotten Son, whom you sent as the Savior of this world. I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Today, Lord, I receive Jesus in my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Forgive my sins. Cleanse and purify my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to start again with you now in this journey. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Redeemer, for saving my life. Amen. 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 You say that prayer from the bottom of your heart. You know what? You have been wonderfully saved. There is the number on the screen. Please, please call that number. Tell us what God is doing with you and in you. We would love to celebrate. We would love to rejoice with you. But we will give you the instructions for you to engage on this journey. Purposefully and fruitfully. So please call that number. For those that are wonderful, Wonderfully saved by Jesus Christ. We have a message to preach. That all stand condemned without Jesus Christ. But now the righteousness of God is revealed to all men. And you are the channel. You are the messenger. You are the feet of glad tidings. To take this message to the rest of the world. So as, as many as believed in him, as many as we believe this message, we move from condemnation to justification. Take this message so that many will be saved. And God richly bless you as you carry on his work. From Dominion Church, you are saying it's been a blessing and an honor to be with you today. So till we meet again next week and continue on this journey exploring what justification is all about. We hope to see you soon. God richly bless you. Shalom.